We've all been there. You're awake to that all too familiar pulsing Panadol resistant stress headache. Your first thought of the day contemplates the face your boss would make if you impulsively quit your job today. You pick up your phone, hoping for a little distraction from your thoughts while you wait for the 7.15 alarm, the last chance to get up and get to work on time. You check social media and confirm that yes, everyone else is happier than you. Precisely at that moment, as if backed by decades of consumer research, you get an email from cheapflights.com. Tickets to Japan are on sale now. Maybe I should book a vacation. Escapism. The tendency to seek or the practice of seeking distraction from what normally has to be endured. Escapism has a negative connotation. If you're an escapist, you're unhappy. You're disconnected with the world and unwilling to take action in your own life. You spend your time absorbed in fantasy places. Anything that takes you away from the here and now. You talking about me? Popular media has long been condemned as escapism used for social control. Around 100 AD, the Roman poet Juvenal coined the phrase bread and circuses. He was referring to the Roman practice of gaining public approval through the manipulation of the public with food and entertainment. Juvenal felt that the common people were neglecting their civil duties in favor of having their selfish desires catered to. Well, it's a good thing we don't do that anymore. The tendency towards escapism can creep up slowly on you. An extra episode here, just one more game there. You tell yourself it's self-care and everyone needs a rest day once in a while. But before you know it, every day is a day that you need to escape from. Now all your downtime is occupied with distractions. You know when you haven't had enough time to yourself because as you lay down and start to drift off to sleep each night, your mind sends intrusive thoughts. Like that time you spilled water on your pants on a school trip and everyone said you'd peed yourself. Psychologist Jennifer Delgado writes, We all have an escapist inside. From time to time we feel the need to change, disconnect, restart. That's why we take vacations, read novels, watch television or videos of kittens on the internet. Good point, Jennifer. Sigmund Freud also saw escapism as part of the human condition. Humans cannot subsist on the scanty satisfaction they can exhort from reality. We simply cannot do without auxiliary constructions. And a few auxiliary constructions sounds alright, probably even healthy. I think certain forms of escapism can be a source of inspiration for creatives and introverts, a way to explore new ideas and come back to daily life with fresh eyes. But in today's world, the world of limitless information, games and content, The means for escaping are sold to us everywhere. If attention is money, then whatever gets your attention and keeps it is profitable. There are enough options out there for the escape enthusiasts that you won't ever have to live in the real world again. And that's probably bad, yeah? So what do we do about it? Norwegian psychologist Frode Stenzing came up with a dualistic model depicting two states of escapism. Escapism in the form of self-suppression stems from motives to run away from unpleasant thoughts, self-perceptions, and emotions. Whereas escapism in the form of self-expansion stems from motives to gain positive experiences through the activity and to discover new aspects of self. Simply put, a bucket list is a list of things you want to achieve before you die. Bucket lists often feature things like going skydiving, visiting the Louvre, diving with sharks, getting a tattoo, and meeting a famous person. If you look at social media, you'll see a never-ending stream of inspirational content, boasting exciting travel destinations for you to add to your bucket list right now. There's bucket lists for food, activities to do with friends and partners, career achievements, and plans for retirement. I found bucket lists for events like Christmas or autumn, and I even saw one YouTube channel promoting a breakup bucket list. These bucket lists for seasons remind me of the to-do lists I made for Stardew Valley, you know, so you don't forget to plant your fruit trees or whatever. Uh. Those people are trying to gamify their lives a little bit too hard. I mean, do you really feel like you've had a successful fall season because you ate both pumpkin and pecan pie? 
I mean, really, it's not that unusual for people to celebrate seasonal changes. Just look at the cherry blossoms in Japan. Whatever, I'm over it. Researchers say that plenty of folks have bucket lists. The main themes are usually travel, desire to accomplish a personal goal or to achieve a specific life milestone, quality time with friends and family, financial stability, daring activities, and fame and celebrity status comes up a bit too. And now you might be wondering, why do we make bucket lists? Surely there's some poncy academic explanation. Yep, there sure is. Several theories have been proposed to explain why we make bucket lists. In 2020, Freud, no, not Freud, coined the idea of the bucket list effect. The notion that we postpone goals until later in life. Like if you're young, you might have some stuff that you want to do, but you don't have the time or money to do it. So you put it off until you're older. I think it's just a selfish wish list. Like I hate those people with their stupid hashtag wonderlust Instagram accounts. They just want attention. I mean, how much money are people dropping on vacations to Instagrammable locations? Bucket lists are just shopping lists for experiences. People think that if you've done a bunch of shit and seen all the world's monuments, then your life means something. But it's just this obsession with consumption. We think we can have whatever we want without any limitations. As I was saying, several theories have been proposed by researchers. Daniel Kahneman's peak end theory says that what people remember from hedonic events are their peaks. It's an attempt to make life memorable. Not to be confused with Maslow's peak experience theory, described as a heightened sense of wonder, awe, or ecstasy over an experience. In 1962, Leach formally defined a peak experience as a highly valued experience, which is characterized by such intensity of perception, depth of feeling, or sense of profound significance as to cause it to stand out in the subject's mind, in more or less permanent contrast to the experiences that surround it in time and space. I.e., that was fucking awesome. Terror management theory would say that the bucket list is a response to death anxiety or fear. The fundamental premise of terror management theory is that in order to make life with the awareness of mortality livable, people and societies create cultural belief systems to manage their anxiety of death. I.e., I can only get through life if I stop thinking about death. Then there's how we develop a sense of self in a world based on consumption. When there's economic downturn, just as it was in the Great Depression, nations require that people continue to have hope, to dream of a better world, and to keep striving to innovate. I.e. keep buying things, going places, and working. Bitch. And I encourage you all to go shopping more. Because when we feel a need inside of us, we ask ourselves, can I buy it? And consumerism says, yes, you can. The fact is, humans get to do basically whatever they want on this planet as long as they have the money to do it. And what we, individuals, want to do when we're comfortable, bored, and stranded without religion or culture is to abide by the set of rules that we've created in this secular society. Rules based on the values that we hold for what is considered a good life. And industries that rely on tourism and entertainment would have us believe that a good life is not only achievable, but also for sale. When the American consumer goes to market, he is bombarded with the claims of advertisers on the air, in the press, from all sides. Okay, I hear you. I guess I need to be mindful of not just falling into any old tourism trap. I don't even know what I'm looking for really, but it's probably not as simple as going skydiving. Okay, I think I've found it. It's called dark tourism. Dark tourism, also known as grief tourism or thanatourism, is that call travelers get from places of extreme human suffering. That's right, trade in your tickets for Disneyland and head over to Hiroshima in Japan or Auschwitz in Poland for a somber holiday of historical significance. See, I think that's what's missing from a lot of modern tourist attractions. Sure, it's cool that your cruise ship has bumper cars, but what if you were actually standing in the Temple of Apollo in the ancient city of Pompeii? I've spent so much time living through the internet and movies, but what about actually standing in that church from Thor? J.R.R. Tolkien argued that escapism was just reality repackaged into a made-up world, but pointed out that fantasies needed an element of horror in them so that they aren't just escapism. 
I think that dark tourism fills that deep-seated desire to seek out novel and sometimes taboo experiences, but where it's not just about pleasure-seeking, it's also about getting in touch with reality, in touch with history, and connecting with people and our past mistakes. It's like the documentary genre of vacations. And sure, some people go to these places for clout, but I think those are the minority. And who cares really? Because the experience of going to a place like the catacombs in France is capable of being so transformative for people that I almost don't care what your motivation was in the first place. Sick fascination, morbid curiosity. Good, the benefits outweigh the negatives in my opinion. Yeah, I think we'll always be into dark tourism. Just think about how many people sat around and watched gladiators get eaten by lions or public guillotine beheadings. Nothing's gonna stop us from seeking out taboo shit. Yeah, and if you're worried about choosing somewhere ethical, just be like, uh, do the locals get a chance to tell their side of the story? Uh, did the locals benefit economically from the site? Hmm, does it all look legit? Like a curated museum, exhibitions, respectful portrayals of historical events, educational content, tour guides, and transparent money transactions? Everybody wants to do something amazing in their lifetime, right? We all want to be the main character of our own story. But what would you be willing to do to achieve your dreams? What would you be willing to sacrifice? Some people choose a path to glory that for most of us would scare the bejesus out of us. I'm certain that there are some people who took that quote, do one thing every day that scares you a little too seriously. Wherever you look, humans are signing themselves up for dangerous shit. We pay to do it. We get paid to do it. We create industries that support it. We flock as audiences to witness it. And we memorialize the champions. And if while you're watching someone take a left hook straight to the face, you start to wonder, why? Though. Good question. Let's see what nature says. Well, if we believe the theory of natural selection, maybe if you're stronger, faster, and smarter, you might survive better? Likewise, Darwin proposed that certain traits evolve because they give individuals a mating advantage. So if you're out there looking for a box of healthy offspring pancake mix, then well, would you look at these displays of physical prowess? That might just reflect reproductive fitness. Mmm, baby. In human history, we can see countless examples of dangerous stunts being performed as part of initiation ceremonies, rites of passage, and traditions that celebrate sports and competition. From the medals of courage given out to soldiers to that effort award you received in fifth grade, humans have for centuries been commemorating the achievements of great men and women. But when we are not at war and things are going mostly all right for us, I guess, want to bet that we'll make up a game to pass the time, make friends, entertain the masses, and ensure that the best of us are given an opportunity to rise to the top in the Hall of Fame. Well, fame and money is a pretty good motivator for young stupid people to do stupid things. Some people will say that they do dangerous acts for the pure love of the thing that they've found their calling. Some people are hoping to discover something about themselves, to find themselves. Others are addicted to the adrenaline, the accolades, the fans, or they just have something to prove. And then there's just plain survival. Dangerous jobs can make big bucks, which is especially of interest to people who don't have many options and need to feed their families. The opportunity to make a million dollars for a Brazilian bull rider is some good incentive to do one of the most dangerous sports in the world. For the rest of us who maybe just want to get close to danger but not actually be at risk of dying, there's tourism. Personally, I'd love to do the cage of death. It's this crocodile feeding tank it's a, it's a, that, it's like a big underwater tank that you go in and then they feed the crocodile next to the tank so you can like see it up close, you know, like right, right there. Do you have a death wish? No, nope, I do not have a death wish. I'd choose something like the cage of death because no one really wants to have an up close and personal experience with a 
box jellyfish or a mosquito with dengue fever. We just want to come close to an apex predator that we have been able to tame to some degree in an environment that's been tested, hopefully, for safety by many other silly tourists with the same bucket list item. Hmm. I don't know. Humans like to think that we have control over nature, that we've made nature our bitch. But as nature often likes to remind us, we are the bitch. We are the bitch. I think in all of us, we have this drive to push our boundaries, to test our own limits and the limits of our environment. And through this testing, we might hope to discover what we're made of. Some of us run headfirst into danger. Others stumble across it by accident, but it is those people who can come away with a profound appreciation for what it means to be alive. However, considering I have a fairly good survival instinct, I'm hoping that there are other ways to appreciate life without necessarily going through a near-death experience. Terry Pratchett says escapism isn't good or bad in itself. What is important is what you are escaping from and where you are escaping to. So let's just say that you take the road of self-expansion, break free of escapist traps, make a bucket list of goals, get yourself to real places and push your comfort zone. Who's to say that that'll change things? Or maybe we need to take a leap of faith every once in a while. What's the worst that could happen?